Teddy Getty Gaston releases her book Alone Together, My Life with J. Paul Getty in September of 2013. She's now 100 years old and close family friend Darcy Hinton Cook interviews her in her dining room. The beautiful Teddy Getty speaks of her life married to one of America's first billionaires, J. Paul Getty. He had promised to come back for me in three months to hear me at my opening musical that Moreski, my teacher, had arranged. And they didn't let him. They didn't let anybody. So he called me on the phone and said, get on a plane, come. And I said, no, I can't. I'm singing on a certain day and I ain't going to go anywhere. Well, that was my big mistake. Because then in about a few days, the doorbell rang. And Maria, not this one, but Maria, went to the door and they walked in. A German and an Italian saying, we're taking you somewhere. And I said, oh, no, no, you're not. Sit down, I'm going to sing for you. <laughs> oh, 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 precious. That's not in the book. No, no. That is precious. There's a lot that is in the book. It's all in those books there on my piano. And when the people did the book, they cut a lot of out. What? If I may ask some other questions. They Can said, you... we don't want to hear you sing. We want to take you with us to the Questora. I said, okay. What is the Questora? The Questora is the police department. Wow. And I had a young lady named Mary, Maria, like this one from China. She was in Italy. And she took me into my bedroom. She said, Signora, you better put something warm on. And so I had a cute plaid dress and a polo coat, a red American polo coat. And it's in there, in my room. I wore it all the time. In that horrible jail, and t I'm telling you, that that was the thing that made me cry. There's the red coat. Wow, Teddy. This needs to be in the museum. That's, that's true. That, this needs to be in the museum. That's, that's true. Well, it isn't going to be. I don't want to have anything in the museum. I understand. I understand that. That one. Yeah. When they put me in jail and they had nuns taking me where I was to go and they took me in this huge hall and women with children were behind certain bars and I remember they said, we're sorry, Signora, we have no more straw. You'll have to lie down here with what we have and they threw the straw on the ground and left me. They took the light and went away. And they were nuns. They were very sweet. And I'll never forget that, pardon me, didn't I dress in it? No, you look terrific. You look beautiful, Teddy. Anyway, I remember that's the first time I really cried because I was scared and I was lonely and I was icy cold. It was December, of course. And there was no light. And I remember we were eight, all wake, wakened up at five with the noise of go to church. So I got up and they put the lamps on. We went to church. Wow. You did must I, read the book. You didn't. Did I did. Not, oh, did you did they it. arrest you because you were Jewish? No. They did they, just, that ever come out? How did you? Oh know, yes, they how did, how did you not go to a concentration camp? They couldn't have put me in a concentration camp. <laughs> there you go, Daddy. Hmm? No, I was working for the New York Herald Tribune. I know, and you were a writer. And there were seven of us. There were six of us and me. The men went to the Monte Latte, and I went to the one that they put me in. The woman's. Finally, they got me together with the others, and that was my luck. But there were three people that were part Jewish. 
three of the men were. All these years I thought you were a Christian scientist because of mommy. No, I was a Christian scientist because I became one. My mother was one. She sent me to church. And I went to a Catholic school. And then, did you read the book? I read it all the way well, through. Well, then you saw that in the beginning, my stepfather Raped was... you? Yeah. I'm so sorry, Teddy, what you've been through. Do you know I forgave him? You have and to. And I read that about it again. Huh? That's incredible. That's, yeah. I that set you free. What? Yeah. To forgive him set you free. Uh, but he went on drinking and doing naughty things. And, and he really was pathetic. And my mother never knew, and I would never have told her if you cut my throat. Oop, is this yours? That's, that's recording you, yes. I pray to God it's recording Mama Mia. you. Mamma <laughs> Mia. <laughs> <laughs> Have it all. But Teddy, the last, all that about Timmy, I just sobbed. Did you read about it? I sobbed. I sobbed. I sat here sobbed. and wrote it. The last five years of my life, I wrote that. I and remember boy, I had a crush on him, we diving for those silver sick. dollars into the pool. I remember Daddy being there for some reason. Yeah, but the thing is that he had this horrible tumor. I remember. If you read my book, you really did. I did. But when... Uh, the boy and I. That I were, couldn't put it down. It he has was to be writing a what I. He was writing what I was saying because I still can't write too well with this hand. I do. I will write you a check any day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good hand and a good check. Teddy, why didn't you ever go after the doctors after what they did to Timmy and killing him? You just didn't I'll do that tell back you in why. that day. When I told Paul, he cried. He was hysterical. And later, he called me back, of course, that night, and he said, we can't. I said, I want to kill him. I'm going to sue them. I'm going to sue this goddamn hospital. Because in all that I did, I never stopped them from doing what they wanted to do. I only said, be careful. Test. And that doctor that gave him the shot that he shouldn't have and never came back to check, is it working? Is What is it doing to him? And it was killing him. And I thought he was getting well. Because he, he was. would have gotten well. But he was That's that what same you said day in the book. That, yeah, he would he have lived. Getting well he was right recovering. Then, and then suddenly whatever they put in him the day before when he was uh, in the hospital, I mean. If he'd never had the plastic surgery, he wouldn't have died, right? He would never have died, no. <gasps> they gave him a shot, I thought, to knock him out to do the thing on his face. That's all. I said, why don't we do it when we get to California? Oh, no, Teddy said, Dr. Holland. Let's do it now, and he'll look so cute. I said, he looks cute now. I don't want you to do it. I called Paul in Europe. He said, I don't want it done. Get him home. And then one day later, the doctors called him, and Paul called me, and he said, well, they say it's better if we do it right now before it goes. I said, okay. That was my mistake. I never said no to anything that they wanted to do. I just said, be careful. For God's sake, be careful. And I used to say, I'll pray for you to do the right thing. Well, this one doctor, he was the one that was in charge of Timmy the day that he went down to have his face what do you call it when face not face lift but reconstructive surgery well yeah but he they cut him here yeah. he had this awful line so they were gonna do it fix it i never knew he went blind what 
You said in the book that he went blind. Yeah, but he finally, he finally saw again. Oh. You can't imagine the things that happened to Timmy. Yes, I can, because I read your book. And Timmy was such an enlightened soul. He loved you more than anybody yeah, could love Yeah, you know, love he a loved mom. his doctors, too. He said, you said that in the book. Doctor, Dr. Hone, oh, you blessed man. And then he asked for a Coke, and they gave him a Coke, and he said, here, doctor, you take it first. I mean, you can't imagine the kid was fantastic. He I really do. I knew Timmy. I was with you. I loved him. I had a huge crush on him because he was older and swimming with me and you with the, the silver coat. I just remember such happy times down at the beach house. That's true. That's all I remember. And I remember you always being this beautiful as you are today and that gorgeous voice oh, yeah, of yours. I, all <laughs> I haven't had anything lifted or shoved anywhere yet. Yeah. I just, what's your secret for all of us that, so we can turn a hundred? You are so Honey, beautiful. You are very beautiful yourself. What are you talking about? I think that's why I love you so much, because you come with me. Listen, I was sent to a Catholic school, Marymount. You know Marymount here? Yes. I went to Marymount. I went to Marymount. <laughs> I went to Marymount. <laughs> you know what, they, what my dad did? When that situation happened, you know, where he did what he did, and then mother said, uh, I'm going to, no, dad said, send her to Europe. So they looked for uh, a school, and they sent me to, to Marymount in Paris, if you read the book, and you did. I did. I went to, Par to Paris to Marymount, which was in Neuilly, just outside of Paris, right near the American Hospital. And I went there for a year and a half, and I went to all the things I had to go to. I got the early morning mass and everything. I loved it. It was marvelous. It didn't bother me. I wasn't a, a, a mad American that just stuck to Christian science. I love Christian science because it told me, don't take in all the crash. Don't take it in. I love because as the ladies in Hawaii are listening, you have the beautiful canary and you mentioned that in your book, singing it. You had a couple of canaries and you this, had to... We had two here, but one of them is a little old now. She doesn't, he doesn't get up, but they're two men. You know, canaries have to be both same. Yes. I didn't uh, know that. <laughs> and ah! So funny. Uh, Teddy, how could you live on the budget that Paul gave you? That's oh, in Italy, I oh, was very easy. Even when you came back and he said him. you can't Did afford you this? Did you know I paid him? Yes, you do. Yes, I do. From the book, I know you paid him. That's what I'm horrified about. Saying he couldn't Listen, afford that's this. The best what was thing your budget? To do with a hundred. Money, borrow it and pay it back. They will never forget it. <laughs> Nobody ever pays you back. You know it if you've lent money, right? Yeah. yeah. But who would think that Mrs. Getty had to work? I didn't have to do. But anything. you loved it. I wanted to. <laughs> you loved and it. I didn't know how to sing the right way. And I remember in the beginning when I first, when he first danced with me, he said, you have a beautiful voice. I love the quality of that gift. No young man ever told me, listen, Tootsie, I love the quality of your voice. He'd say, I like everything else about you. Shut up, don't sing, let's do it. You know? <laughs> right? Right, exactly. This man fascinated. And I guess I fascinated him. And he said, you know, it's so funny, Teddy, I uh, went swimming with you in Martha's Vineyard. We took a boat over to... You made mad, passionate love on the beach. Yeah, we did. I think that is so But alive. I was amazed. Beautiful. I thought, oh my God, wonder if the, if the, uh, if some children come flying by. 
I don't think you were thinking of that at that exact no, moment. No, I wasn't. <laughs> you seemed very much in love. Mary Paul had a hard time. He said, I'm not able to marry you. I don't think I should marry any woman. I met married four times. I'm not very good as a husband. I said, that's okay. <laughs> But the thing I think that attracted him to me, besides liking to dance with me and feeling happy, uh, was that I, he said you should do something with that voice. There's a quality in it. I think you could really, if you study, you could be an opera singer or a concert singer, something like that, Teddy. And I looked at him and I said, that's exactly what I'm thinking too. Thank you for thinking it. And then he said, I'd like to have somebody like Flagstadt hear you. And then he went to Flagstadt. You know, she was a great Wagnerian opera singer in America. And she said, Paul, if, she, if this woman you love has any quality of voice, have her sing for Madame Marchese in London. She's the greatest teacher in the world. So he had asked me to make several songs. I, he took them to Marchese and she said, I don't know whether she would ever make opera, but there's something there I like. Send her to me. So he said, I'm going to send you to Marchese. I said, if you do, I'm going to pay you back. He said, okay. I said, Paul. <laughs> and that was how our relation was. It's the best thing. I told this to any young girl I've met who said, I'm dying to do this and that and the other thing. I said, if somebody ever helps you, say, look, man, woman, or child, whoever it is, I just want you to know, if you do pay a hundred dollars to somebody to get me there to do the part, I will repay you. And do it. And do it. You, it's that it's, doing it. It not was saying the it. first time. Because I made a hundred dollars my first job. And when I got it, got the check, I sent him Ten percent, which was what ten dollars. He couldn't believe it, and that's what I did. And he cashed the check because the check came back to me with his name on it in the back. That's really funny, isn't it? Yes. I think that's so sad that he kept asking you to not buy a big car. Put you on allowance. Oh my God, but you know, he's then my best girlfriend, G. Donnelly, and Betsy Beaton, who I adored. I lived at the Algonquin Hotel and shared an apartment with Betsy. And Jean came in one day and said, I had lunch with Paul Getty today. And this is what he asked me to give you. And she came in with two furs that thing. And she threw herself in the bed. She said, I'm so damn tired of carrying these birds around. You look at them and take them. The night she went in bed, she's in my bedroom and went to one of the beds and lay down and went to sleep. I opened it up and I said, I'm not going to accept it. I can't accept it. I can't accept a fur coat. And I didn't. I sent it back to her. And Jean said, you're a damn fool. I never saw a woman like you. You're crazy. It's going to be cold next week. It's almost December, Teddy. You can accept it as a Christmas gift. Oh, and I said, oh, no, I can't. Take it back, Jean. I got a good old polo coat. <laughs> now, do you love the Getty Museum? I love it. But is there anything of Teddy Getty there? I hope not. Oh, they have my book. Fantastic. <laughs> I hope they're selling it there too.
Did you ever spend time there in living? Was there any quarters there at all? The or? one in Malibu you're talking yes. about. I have to laugh. When they opened the museum, Paul called me from Europe and said, please go, because he wasn't here. He was trying to go to see the king of Arabia. Yeah. And he was trying to do a deal with him. So we didn't want to come back for the opening of his museum. And I said I would go. It was where the ranch house was right. originally. So I went to the opening of the museum mm -hmm. with Mr. Blackwell. Remember him? Yes, loved I loved him. him. Mommy loved him too. She oh, too yes. He made the Blackwell best damn clothes for us. Yeah. Good friend. His friend's still living. His partner? I loved Mr. Black. He was always fun. He was, he was so kind and loving to every woman that he ever worked yes. with. Oh. And he knew how to make a big woman look well. Your mother was big. Mother was big. And I am big. You are not big, Teddy. Honey, I'm sorry, I am. So. Now, with the Getty Museum, I remember when we were with J. Paul in England in the 70s, everybody was coming around showing him pictures of his museum, yeah. but he hadn't seen it. He hadn't seen it. it. And they were all showing him pictures and uh, he hadn't seen it. So, did he not see the museum? Because I just remember, I mean, I remember the never, stories as a 20 year old. How I did he never return to America? He never returned to America. So, he never saw the museum in Malibu as a museum. Yeah, and they would just bring in pictures of this. Because I was there when the attorney was bringing pictures. This is your new. Um, uh, show and, and things like that. Okay, I remember that and I... Well, let me tell you um, this fact that I was at the opening of this, of the museum. Yeah. Um, I was very quiet. I didn't put my face anywhere where anybody would see me. <laughs> but anyway, I was there with Gigi and friends and there's a beautiful carpet. <clears throat> Yeah. And then they said, uh, don't step on this. And I laughed. I said, I'm sorry. I used to play tennis on it. I mean, backgammon. Because we had it in the apartment in New York. But then, strangely enough, she said, went on talking about Mr. Getty did this, Mr. Getty did that. And somebody said, oh, when did, they li when did he live here? And she looked up and she said, well, Mr. Getty never lived here. At that, I looked up at Mr. Blackwell and I said, if Paul didn't live here, who the hell was I sleeping with? <laughs> that broke everybody. They all fainted. <laughs>